Okay. Uh, just wanted to say a couple of words of welcome to those of you who were not uh, there uh, last night to this uh, new venue and a new day, a cold day, but a sunny day. So uh, we're hoping to, uh, that the weather will only warm up and, um, and the sun will, will stay around. Uh, this, I, I just wanted to uh, say that um, the, over the course of the next two days, the, uh, the organization of what we have prepared for you, um, on the one hand, is organized. On the other hand, is designed and devised to sort of speak across categories. So um, the first session, this morning session, uh, circulation, European perspectives, uh, the afternoon session, trade and reception from Seville to Manila, uh, session three, other geographies. I think what we will see is, in fact, that those kind of thematic components are present across all of the different papers and all of the different panels. So what this is really meant to be, and I'm going to turn the word over to Ken in just a moment, is really a kind of a cross-geographic, a cross-temporal uh, conversation um, to make connections. It's the reason why we kept the number of participants and speakers to a relatively small number, um, but we also very much expect that those of you who are here in the audience who are not on the program are going to participate as actively and as vocally, um, which is one of the reasons why we left also the comments uh, to the commentary uh, to, a, to a minimum in terms of individuals and are going to open things up as well. So I just wanted to um, say thanks to Ken for um, originally having the idea about this and helping to bring together all of these fantastic uh, people, to um, Nicole um, and to Brenda for uh, helping us to sort of get everything rolling, to this burly men carrying speakers, and um, <laughs> everybody else, uh, welcome, and I'll turn things over to Ken. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. I appreciate all you coming out on this terribly cold uh, day. Um, just, I know these are um, some long sessions, so the first little bit of housekeeping is if you need to use a restroom, women's room out the door and down the, down the hallway, and men's room is one flight down. Um, I've only got a couple things I want to say. One is, that, you know, again, housekeeping. The talks are going to be about 30 minutes each. Uh, we have no commentator for this panel, so my role here is simply to introduce and to, to keep time. And um, this came about, um, I've been thinking about it for quite some time. I think, in fact, when I applied for this job about eight years ago now, uh, one of the projects that I wanted to do was this conference, in fact. Um, I had known for a long time about the conference that uh, Norman Firing arranged in uh, 1984, the book in the Americas that produced a big exhibit and then uh, a, an exhibit catalog, and an enormous and very interesting conference. Um, in fact, when I, my first day on the job, the uh, conference papers were rather uh, fortuitously sitting on my desk. Someone had that planned for me. And I've, uh, I've read through them, and it's, it's um, quite um, stunning and refreshing to see. Unfortunately, they weren't published. The goal was to get all of them published. Um, but we have them in manuscript. And it's, it's really kind of stunning to see that over the last 25 years, there's been somewhat of a, of a, of a blossoming of the historiography on the history of the book in the Americas. But that being said, there's still quite a bit more to do, and that's part of the reason that I mounted the exhibit that I did and uh, wanted to bring this uh, conference together. And uh, to that end, we have the closing roundtable discussion. And I've already dropped on my colleagues a, 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 an orienting question that I, I'd like them to think about. And if they choose to participate um, and reflect on it at length, then I've asked them to contribute, but it's something else that I, I want to let you all know about. So uh, you can think about it over the course of the next two days. And um, if you uh, also want to um, offer comments from the audience, I would particularly appreciate it. So um, with that in mind, let me give you a sense of what that question is. Uh, and, and it's rather long, so forgive me. 
But over a century on, we are still strongly reliant on Medina's bibliographies and documentary collections. And for those of you who don't know, Medina, Jose Toribio Medina was a Chilean bibliographer who uh, compiled documents and bibliographies related to each city in the Americas, including Manila, um, each city in the Americas that had a printing press between uh, 1539 in Mexico and the early 19th century uh, throughout the Americas. Now likewise, with some exceptions, a great deal of work remains anachronistically bounded by national borders, and some of this may have to do with Medina and his influence because each one of those is organized by city, so we think very small and very local. And this, I believe, is a reflection of the fact that on the one hand, the historiography remains underdeveloped in comparison to Europe and the United States, but on the other hand, and on the other hand, I should say, there are historians of Spanish America at work on book historical topics who wouldn't consider them such, themselves as such. And um, Cristina Soriano and I found one of them at the AHA in January. Um, there's a great deal we still need to do about, uh, to, to know about printing in the book trade in Spanish America, about individual printers and booksellers on the one hand, but also about long distance networks of trade on the other. Uh, before we can contemplate something like the American Antiquarian Society's volume, The Colonial Book in the Atlantic World. So with that in mind, um, the, the kind of broad questions I, hoped, uh, I hope for po folks to think about is why has the historiography underdeveloped as it has or developed as it has? Uh, and what do we need to know in order to write a fuller history of the book in Spanish America? And more importantly, and this is the difficult question, how are we going to do that? Because um, there's still quite a bit. And it entails work from Antwerp to Seville to Mexico to Lima to Manila. Um, so with that, I want to move forward and introduce our three speakers today, and then we can get started. Uh, first will be uh, Stein van Rosen from the University of Antwerp. Uh, speaking on keeping up with the Verdussens, Antwerp as an international hub for Catholic books in the 17th century. Next, Natalia Maillard from the University Pablo de Olavide and with the title of Book Trade Networks in Counter-Reformation Seville. And finally, Joseph Rezek from Boston University, whose title is Masters, uh, Matters of Circulation in the Early Black Atlantic. John Marant's Narrative, 1785 to 1829. And with that, I'd like to introduce Stein. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm quite honored to open today's uh, uh, session because I feel like I'm representing one of the most remote areas of the Spanish uh, Empire. Uh, and uh, just to uh, introduce you, uh, what we are going to be talking about, because I don't think everybody here will know uh, a lot, ev everything there is to know about the Southern Netherlands. This is a map uh, from, the, from the era, from the, era, from the time. Um, and what you see here are the Southern, so the, the Dutch provinces, meaning the 17 provinces um, in the 16th century. So the areas in green that you see, that are, that's the area I will be talking about, that are the Habsburg Netherlands or the Southern Netherlands. And they are in short the areas that were reconquered by the Spanish uh, at the end of the 16th century. And that, those are areas that became Catholic areas. And the, to the north of that, you have the Dutch Republic, uh, the Northern Netherlands, uh, where uh, they were primarily uh, Protestant. And the town we'll be talking about is the city of Antwerp, I don't know if this works. Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, you will see it's on the, the north there of the green area in Brabant. Uh, it was a city where the Protestant revolt started, and it was one of the last uh, conquests of the Spanish troops. Uh, and that city tr retransformed itself from a humanist printing center into a Catholic uh, printing center, one of the uh, bulwarks of uh, Catholicism, uh, if you may. And uh, this talk I will be having today will be a case study. Uh, it will be about one family only and, 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 and their business uh, uh, s selling Catholic books. 
Uh, this is their shop sign. There are not a lot of shop signs that are kept from, from the 17th century. The red line, it's a line in terracotta uh, that is still in the Museum Planta and Moretis uh, today. And just to give you an idea of uh, the history of this family, it's a family that was active from the 16th to the 19th century. Uh, and they started a lot of bookshops. I just uh, listed here the most important ones. Uh, just to give you an idea about how many different bookshops they started uh, over the centuries. Uh, because, but because it would be too uh, great in, uh, a, a, a job to talk about all of them today, I will focus on the main uh, printing house, that is the Red Lion, um, and for the first three generations uh, only. Uh, but that gives us a span of about 100 years of typographic uh, activity. So we'll see, we will talk about the change that happens over those generations what they are doing, especially uh, concerning uh, the distribution of books. Now, why did I chose this family to work on? Uh, the main reason is because, because it was active for so long, uh, until the 19th century, uh, a, a, quite a, 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 an important archive, a business archive, has been preserved. And that is quite rare uh, for uh, printing uh, firms from, from that time. Actually, the only other example we have from that early on with, with such a large uh, business archive is also situated in Antwerp, and it's the, uh, the much more famous uh, plant in Moretis uh, dynasty. And actually, the Verdusen suffered a lot from uh, uh, there being a bigger, a bigger fish uh, in, in the pond. Uh, and they always were compared to this larger, more important uh, printing house. And uh, in the comparison, they always uh, uh, were, were um, judged as the lesser one, the, the, the more plain one. As you can see from this uh, slide, this, um, this is actually an introduction of the edition of the business letters of the Verdusens. So it's actually a book about the Verdusens, where the author clearly says that although they might be clever businessmen, they are nowhere to compare to the high morals. And, uh, business uh, vision, visions of uh, the larger Plantin Moretis uh, dynasty. So, my research that I did on this family is um, uh, focused around editorial strategies, and I looked at several ones, several different strategies they were using, uh, and I just uh, finished my PhD on this topic uh, last year. Um, but for today, I will focus mainly on those uh, distribution networks and to a lesser extent also the production of uh, the Ferdusen family. Um, so why is this uh, important to look at these distribution networks? Basically for two main reasons. The general reason, of course, being how were books uh, uh, transported from Northern Europe to Southern Europe and even the Americas. But it also involves rewriting or at least rethinking a little bit the history of printing or the history of printers uh, in the Southern Netherlands as well. Uh, because all kinds of things are written about that period uh, that to my extent are, 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 are incorrect or incomplete. And the main reason for that is that everybody only looked at Planty Moretus and used it as a pass pro toto, if you may, for what happened uh, in the whole country, and uh, this, uh, well, I will, I will hope to prove today is, is not really the right uh, way to proceed. So this is a quote from another director of the museum uh, saying that even after 1585, 1585 being the fall of Antwerp in, uh, uh, to the Spanish troops, so the re of Antwerp, if you may, uh, that the Ovikina Plantiana stayed the most important firm. And then there is an older quote, but uh, more in general, to, to, and that talks about the complete decay of printing after 1648. Uh, printing becomes provincial in Antwerp, not important, and, and certainly not uh, uh, of any international uh, importance. And you can even see that on the website of the Planty Moretis Museum. It feels like I'm really... Uh, <laughs> Discrediting the museum, it is not true, I love the museum, but I just want to point out there is kind of a, 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 a general trend. Uh, it's about this area here that quotes uh, the, the main periods of the family. You have Plantin here, you have Moretus, then you have the 
Baltazar Morietis, and then, you, and then you're only at the begin, middle of the 17th century, and then you have everybody else <laughs> here together uh, saying that, uh, and this spans 200 years. So it, it, there is this idea about, indeed, the, the Planti Morietis family was not that interesting anymore. Uh, so for sure, because they were the largest one, nothing else interesting uh, happened uh, uh, in terms of uh, printing uh, dynasties. So, this is just a graph to show um, some of the main uh, families that were active in uh, the Spanish book trade from the 16th century. Uh, there are the two big names, Stelsius and Nutius, active in the middle of the 16th century, so even before Plantin. And this graph kind of shows how, how over time, the Verdusen family uh, took over their printing workshops uh, or collaborated a lot with, with, with descendants of those families. Um, so there is, in a way, um, a tradition of printing that, that, goes, that crosses family borders uh, and that is kind of uh, revitalized or taken over by the Verdusens from, let's say, the 1630s, 1640s. And one uh, very uh, interesting example of that are these crown plates uh, that are being preserved in Antwerp. They're not on display, they're somewhere uh, in the stacks uh, of uh, the uh, Antwerp Museum. And this is actually a crown plate depicting Johannes Stelsius, a printer. So it's from his house. Uh, and there are very rare uh, examples of printers being uh, 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 depicted in wood you know, while, they, while they are at work. Uh, this is another one, there are more. Uh, this is where yeah, there are uh, this is of Franciscus Stelsius. So it's kind of funny to see this comes from the printing house. It was in the printing house until the 19th century at a time when the Verdusens were already printing there. So they were quite literally working under uh, the, the images of their predecessors. So they were every day kind of aware that they were working in the tradition of international uh, book trade, Spanish book trade, uh, going back to the middle of the 16th century. Okay, now I would like to talk a little bit about the production of the Verdusen family and how this evolved over time, over the course of a century. Um, and if you look at this graph, this is the number of publications that I found uh, of this family. Um, you get the idea that the, um, the general trend of uh, a downfall in the second half of the 17th century uh, might be true because you see at the production here that the, the, the most production is situated in the first half of the 17th century and it kind of declines uh, in the second half of the 17th century. But this is in a way a very dangerous thing to do if you only look at the number of titles uh, being produced because from a printer's point of view, the mind of a printer, to use the term of uh, Roger Chartier's book. Um, you don't count in titles, you count in amount of paper you are able to sell. And um, what I try to do is make another graph, uh, taking into account the amount of paper, the amount of sheets uh, that is being uh, produced. And this gives a very different image, uh, where you clearly see that quite literally in the beginning of the second half of the 17th century, the production uh, dramatically increases, almost doubles, and stays on a high level well into uh, the end of the uh, 17th century. So it's something to consider. And there is more going on. Uh, if you look at uh, the formats in which the books are produced, uh, there is one general trend, quite obvious, that is that the largest format, the folio format, becomes more and more important until it consists about almost two-thirds of the books being produced are being uh, produced in this large uh, format. And finally, the languages. Uh, again, very clear evolution from uh, a production that is primarily in the vernacular, in Dutch, uh, to international languages, most of them, more importantly, Spanish, but, uh, sorry, Latin, but also uh, Spanish towards the end of the 17th century. <coughs> So this very brief, very general overview teaches us something that indeed in 1650 something changes, but it's not the downfall you're expecting to, fall, to, to find. Uh, it's a trend going to more voluminous books, some more expensive books, bigger formats, more sheets, and international languages. So they are searching for a new audience here, or new readership. <laughs>
Secondly, uh, distribution and how does that evolve uh, over time. Uh, I used here uh, inventories I found in a business archive uh, listed in the account books. Um, and uh, these are the, this is a comparison between the end of the second generation, so the middle of the 17th century, and the end of the third generation, the end of the 17th century. And you see two things. Uh, the first is there are a lot fewer contacts. Uh, so you might again think, ah, things are going bad because they, they deal with a lot less people. But actually, if you look at the kind of people they're dealing with, uh, what they're actually doing is they skip all the small players, all the small villages, all the small towns are rooted out. They only deal with the big, the big guys and in the big cities. And uh, well, I don't know exactly what happened, but I think they would leave it up to them to then redistribute the books further uh, uh, to the smaller uh, centers. And the other trend that is quite obvious uh, is that, uh, well, the local, um, um, the local uh, b businesses, they are in decline. Uh, so there are less uh, partners in the southern Netherlands, less in the United Provinces, less in Germany even. But Spain, Portugal, and France become more important uh, in their distribution network. This is another graph that was kind of uh, shocking to me. This is the, um, the, um, the, well, the, the, the appearance of the Verdissens on the Frankfurt Fair. Um, so how many books, the, the graph shows how many titles they were selling at the fair compared to how many titles other printers in Antwerp were selling at the fair and how much of those books uh, in terms of percentage of the Verdissens production was actually also sold on the fair. And you see that they're, they be, they're kind of uh, active on the fair. They have a, a, quite a, an important uh, uh, amount of books there. But what happens, really, it's, it's from one year to the other. 1671, they leave. They never come back. And the same goes for all the other uh, printers from Antwerp. They kind of collectively decide to leave the Frankfurt uh, Book Fair. Um, so there again, you see a change in where they actually want to sell uh, their books. And what we will see is that there is a trend moving away from Central Europe to uh, uh, directly dealing with uh, merchants in the south of Europe and consequently to the Americas. So that's the kind of uh, summary of what I was talking about. So let's talk about the network. How are books actually traveling from Antwerp to Spain, Portugal, and the Americas. The first thing that is very clear from that, the business archives, is their knowledge of the market. I mean, they had agents in most of the cities, and they were very well aware of where books were wanted and which kind of books were wanted there. Uh, I know of letters being written to, to Antwerp, to the Verdissen, saying, in this town, we need a book on medicine in that kind of format. That is what we need to find, and we need to get it there, because it's not there, available there. The other thing that is kind of obvious from the second half of the 17th century that there are some printers, some centers that are after the same books. They all want a share of that uh, Iberian uh, market. And they try to make deals together, exchange books, so not everybody uh, has to print the book by himself, so, but they can sell the same book and, and kind of collaborate in a way. Um, but that, um, and just to show you how complicated things are, I will, I will tell you one example. Uh, this is a work uh, printed by uh, Gonet. It's a work on Thomistic uh, theology, uh, printed in France, uh, but that the Verdissons were very interested in. They wanted to have this book. They wanted to be able to sell this book without actually having to print it. So what they did is they wrote to the publishers, uh, first to uh, Berthier in Paris, and the letter they wrote kind of went like this. They said, well, we heard a, a rumor that something in, and somebody in Antwerp wants to pirate your book. Um, but uh, we'll, we will help you. And as to, if you send us 50 copies of the book, 50 copies of the, book uh, the guy in question will probably cease to publish it. And uh, you know, we will uh, save the market for you. Of course, there was no such printer. Nobody really wanted to print the book. It was just a way for them to convince them to uh, sell them some copies. So Berthier declines. He doesn't want to work with him. 
So the next letter we find is him writing to a printer in Frankfurt to ask if he's interested in pirating this book. Um, the guy, the printer in Frankfurt also says no, and so you find them writing again to Berthier, the same printer, asking for books. He says no. Then they write to the other printer printing the book. He also says no. Uh, then they contemplate printing the book themselves, but in the end, uh, they, they, don't, they, don't, they decide don't, not to do so. And the last letter I found, find is a letter to a printer in Cologne uh, with the same question if he wants to pirate, if he wants to print uh, this book. The question of piracy is, 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 is uh, controversial because in reality there is nothing illegal here. As soon as you go beyond the national borders, there is actually no law preventing you to do this. You can only see this as, as this, um, like dishonorable or some, something like that, but there is not a real law preventing this too. But um, this book exists. This is the book the Verdissens asked to pirate. Uh, and just a small search of this um, learns that uh, this book is available in Spain, this book is available in Latin America. It's, um, but if you see this book today, I mean, the name of the Verdusen family is nowhere on this book. You have no idea they were involved, although they are clearly the engine behind the whole thing. Uh, so this kind of makes us, um, or should make us uh, worry about how to interpret books that are actually in uh, other libraries and to what extent you can trust the information that is being provided in a certain book, especially uh, if it's about information the printers want you to have about the book. And this is just one example. There are more examples. So when they had the right amount, the right kind of books, uh, they make plans to ship the books uh, to Spain. And here, they don't use the local uh, harbors. They really couldn't because there was still a war going on. But they use, very interestingly, the harbors in the, in the Dutch Republic to, sell the book, to get the books to Spain. And well, they use dif different harbors uh, for different destinations, uh, Ostende, Rotterdam, and more, the most important city for them to use was Middelburg, where they went to Bilbao, Lisbon, and Cadiz. So, so far I was only uh, able to follow up on one route, so I chose to use the route to uh, Cadiz, uh, because I thought that would be uh, the most uh, interesting one. Um, and so what happens, the books are in Middleburg. There they have an agent for them, that in this case was a brother-in-law who was responsible to get the books on the, on the boat. There are all kinds of things they write to him, saying, you know, make sure uh, you wait until the ship is almost full, so the books are not on the bottom of the ship, so the books will not get wet. Uh, so all those kind of things. So this family, this guy was a brother-in-law responsible to deal with the books in Middleburg. He sends the book to Cadiz, um, where again there is, and this is interesting, only uh, for the trade going to uh, Spain and Portugal, you find uh, general merchants involved. In all the other cities, they work directly with other booksellers. Uh, for the trades uh, to, for example, Cadiz, they use merchants. A lot of the times, they're expats, people originally from the low countries that are, uh, that are uh, active there as merchants, and they uh, are responsible to get the shipments off the boat and then sell it on to booksellers, in this case, uh, in Sevilla. And, well, in the archive in Seville, I found a number of people uh, involved. Some of them are also from the low countries, others are not. And this Juan Salvador Perez uh, proves to be, at least for the case of the Verdusens, one of the central figures in uh, the book trade in Seville. So, um, because this Salvador Perez had very close ties to the Procurador de las Indias uh, of the Jesuits, and um, actually in the will of Perez, we find only four privileged partners and Verdusen is one of those people. Uh, the other guy is the procurador himself. There was one merchant of Madrid and one from Amsterdam. That's it. So it proves that he actually has quite a central role in uh, this network. Um, and Salvador Perez, he says he's a bookseller, but he actually is selling all kinds of things, uh, even real estate. Uh, he takes care of the houses of the Jesuits, uh, etc. cetera. 
The next thing you find, so you, this kind of shows you need to find, read a lot of documents to actually follow one shipment, are all kinds of contracts that are being made. Uh, because Perez uh, is actually not traveling himself, he has people who do that for him. Uh, and they, they, they are the, the, the well-known cargadores who travel back and forth to the New World uh, roughly once every two years and get the books to the New World. I listed uh, some examples uh, just to show you an, an idea about the size. Uh, it's very interesting, the first uh, shipment was to a tailor, so it's not really a bookseller who, uh, who buys the books. Um, the value of the books is quite substantial. I mean, this must be a thousand of books, I think, uh, because it's uh, yeah, for the equivalent of 7,000 guilders, and one guilder was a daily wages of a skilled worker, so it means it's a considerable shipment. Um, so to finish my talk, I don't know if I still have time, yeah. <laughs> to finish my talk, I want to sh show you, give you an idea of which kind of books are actually going to uh, Mexico, because I only followed up on Mexico. So I, you, you will see I had to make a, a couple of choices, uh, because, and that is one of the things uh, that is, I think, crucial to this kind of research that is very hard to do it alone. Actually, you need to collaborate because otherwise you need several lifespans to uh, <laughs> have an, uh, actually only an idea of what happened. Um, so I'll just tell you some interesting facts about the books that I found there. Um, I went there near the end of my research, and um, I was surprised by the number of books that I hadn't seen yet in all the libraries in Europe. And it took me a while to figure out what was going on. And actually what was happening um, is that those books were actually not new books. A lot of those were not new. They were books by other big, important booksellers from Antwerp, but old, 50 years old sometimes. And what the Ferdusians did was they changed the title page, put their name on it, and present it as their own work. Um, which seems like you are dumping old books into a, a, a foreign country, but it's, it's more complicated than that because actually those people were big printers and were still big printers. For example, if you think it's a good idea to rip out the title page of the Ofikina Plantiniana, uh, which would still be considered uh, one of the best uh, printers in the world at that time, it says something about how you view yourself, how you see your status, that it feels this is not a commercial suicide if you sell a book of planting as your own work. Um, but I think a lot also has to do with the fact that, and we see this in letters coming from booksellers uh, to the Verdusen firm, uh, that they are, really looking, they are really looking for new books. They don't want old books, and books being new is really um, uh, very important to them as a, uh, being able to sell, uh, sell the books to customers uh, in, for example, Mexico. So this is an example, this is like the most uh, lazy example, uh, where they actually didn't change the title page, but they pasted over the imprint here. <laughs> um, they did a better job at other times, but this, I just put it in there because, yeah, sometimes they just went, yeah. Um, let's just paste over the imprint. And, uh, and this makes, uh, so this is very easy to spot, because you have uh, the printer's device that is, oh, I went too fast. The printing device that is actually not their device, but that of the original printer, the uh, Van Meurs uh, family. Uh, but in other cases, you have a totally new title page, and then you really need bibliographic research uh, to figure out that this was actually another book. Um, and it's very easily, well, very easily mistakes are made. There are a lot of catalogs where things are cataloged as a book from a certain printer, while actually it's uh, done by somebody else. So, just to give you an example of this. So, um, so near the end of the 17th century, the Verdussens uh, have such a name for themselves in the New World that actually they, have, they are getting pirated themselves. Um, and also, those, um, in a lot of cases, those uh, uh, examples are not spotted in uh, bibliographies or catalogs. Um, this is, for example, a work on the Council of Trent that is supposedly printed by a guy called Franciscum Berdusen. So, I don't know, but um, <laughs> if somebody replaces a V with a B, and you only have one S instead of two, 
Um, I think it's kind of obvious that the, the person printing this book was Spanish speaking. Um, and furthermore, Franciscus Ferdusen does not exist. So this is an, a made up name uh, of a Spanish printer using the name and uh, 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 yeah, the, the, the commercial value of the name to sell this book in Spain and the New World. But it can be even more uh, complicated. For example, this is quite an important book on the history of uh, Mevo Granada uh, that says to be printed in Antwerp by Juan Baptista Verdusen. Uh, this is a printer that actually exists and was active at the time, but from um, the typographical elements in that book, it's very clear to see that this is actually a book done by a civilian bookseller, uh, Thomas Lopez de Aro, of which uh, Pedro Herrera, Herrera did a lot of research as well. Uh, he is a guy and, uh, coming from Leiden originally, and he did a lot of books uh, um, with the imprint of the Verdusens, and a lot of times this is not spotted anywhere, so you really have to know that this is uh, a book done in Seville using the name of uh, Ferdusen. So just to conclude this talk, I would like to say that yes, indeed, uh, for the Ferdusens, the year 1650 was an important year, but it was an important year in, the, in that they decided uh, to leave the local markets and kind of use uh, the international market, international uh, um, book trade to uh, find new markets, to stay in the business. And they did so with success because they remained to be active until the 19th century, while a lot of other booksellers only lasted for two, three generations maximum. And another t interesting thing we see is that Antwerp transformed itself into a hub for Catholic books, in this way connecting uh, both North and Eastern Europe to Southern Europe. Uh, and this really contradicts the image that we have at least in um, the historiography of uh, the Southern Netherlands, that uh, the fact that Antwerp was reconquered by the Spanish uh, meant the beginning of the decay of that city. There were actually a lot of people who greatly benefited from being part of that world empire. Uh, and in doing so, this is the thing I didn't really talk about a lot, is that they were rivals of Leonese booksellers who uh, were trying to do uh, the same thing. And the third thing and that I hope we will hear more about uh, today and tomorrow is the central role of the Jesuits in all of this uh, because uh, by their worldwide network it was really easy to sell books uh, internationally because payment was being uh, uh, secured because they could transfer money basically all over the world. So thank you very much for listening and uh, thank you. for that very, very interesting talk. And our next speaker is Natalia Maillard uh, with the title Book Trade Networks in Counter-Reformation Seville. Thank you very much to the John Carter Brown Library and to Ken for inviting me to be here. And as I always say, I apologize for my English. I'll I'll try to do my best, that is the most I can say. Um, the paper, sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint, but my PowerPoints usually are awful, so it's better <laughs> like that. <laughs> so uh, it's always for undergraduates. And anyway, my paper today is the result, or one of the first results, of a previous and all research that I did for my PhD thesis about the book trade in Seville in the second half of the 16th century. And the new questions I had in the last years about the relationship between counter-reformation and book culture or writing culture in the, Iber in, in the Iberian world, in the Hispanic world. So uh, in 1517, when the religious breakup started in Europe, the printing press was really to be an effective weapon in the hands of the adversaries, no matter which sides they were on. But quite often, scholars had considered that the, has considered the reform side the only one that took a clear advantage of the printing press, creating what has been described by Fernando Bouza as one of the most widespread cliches in Western religious and cultural historiography. 
The idea that from the beginning, the Protestant countries, life, uh, in the Protestant countries, life and culture were defined by the direct reading of religious texts, including the Bible, in the vernacular, while Roman Catholicism proscribed or restricted it for its own believers. Uh, nowadays, all this narrative is being confronted by new research, and that's also what I try to do with my, with my own research. Obviously, without forgetting all the bad side and the repression side, but we cannot focus only on that. Uh, already, for instance, in his work, The French Book, published in 1996, Henri Gerard Martin, already, he already remarked some of these issues. For instance, he remarked the enormous quantity of religious tracts inspired by what is commonly referred to as, uh, to as the Counter Reformation as well as the enormous consequence for printing that the decision taken at the Council of Trent finally had. He also speak about, the, about something that could be considered a key, or at least I consider, a key factor in the understanding of those matters. The common interest found by book professionals and religious authorities in Catholic uh, countries. Uh, in his own words, during this period, theological and spiritual literature provided printers and booksellers with most of their work. It is not surprising, therefore, that they proved to be very obedient to the wishes of the church, which warranted them both text to publish and clientele to purchase, to purchase them. Uh, his examples are French, obviously, but similar ones can be found in other countries, and I'll I'll expose some of them at the end of the paper. Um, we know indeed about the importance of merchants and book merchants in the spread of the Reformation, but we do not know so well the networks through which Catholic books circulated within Europe and beyond. The work by Sten is an example of, of this new research and how, how we can profit for, from, from that. Uh, my own research, as I said, tried to answer some of those questions by studying the development of book trade networks in the city of Seville from the Council of Trent uh, to the first decades of the 17th century. My idea is to, to complete our research, uh, I mean, to research from the, around 1550 to 1650 with the Peace of Westphalia, and, but I still have archive work to do, but I, it's almost finished, my archive research. Um, well, as Pedro Rueda said in one of his work, there's a lack of systematic and general studies of the book trade and its evolution during the 16th and 17th century. Um, that's what I'm trying to do, to create a comprehensive and a systematic narrative of those matters. I have to say that I'm finding a little bit problematic to do so, to, make a, to create a comprehensive narrative, because I have a lot of data, a lot of information. I'm not focusing on a family. I'm, I'm gathering information about all the booksellers and printers in the city that I find in the archives and other sources. Um, so I'm having problems to create a, a narrative. Um, any idea or suggestion will be thanks. <laughs> so, uh, what I have found is that it's important to highlight the internationalization of book trade in Catholic countries, in Catholic Europe, or in the Catholic world. Because otherwise, preconceptions and misleading assumptions might lead us to conclusions that are not supported by their archival sources. For instance, in 2008, in a, in a work from, by, uh, made in 2008, it is said, in Spain, it is generally believed that excessive censorship caused a stagnation in the book trade by the mid-century, by the mid-16th century. Instead, several case studies about book trade in Spain and in the Americas uh, point toward an augmentation of the circulation of, book, of books by, by the mid-16th century, um, particularly towards the reinform, reinforcement of the links between the Iberian Peninsula and the international book trade. So it's just the opposite what we find if we go to the archives. So that's why we need to highlight that internationalization. Indeed, 
what I found is that step by step, or what I think is that step by step, some Catholic territories were linked to each other through the circulation of books. Not only from a cultural point of view, you have to consider the huge amount of common readings that the counter-reformation offered to Catholic countries, but also from an economical one. A good proof of that can be found in two documents from Spain and Italy, the, or if we compare these two documents. In 1560, Sevillian printers and booksellers complained about the index issued, issued, issued sorry, appear, that appeared just one year before, the first in the Spanish index of forbidden books, uh, that forbade anonymous books in the vernacular. The document is well known, Clive Griffin published it already. Um, what they said, they affirmed in their complaint that the prohibition was damaging for their business because it prevented them from printing also good books, buenos libros, that have been always used and that it was a, a problem for them and for the public, especially for kids. Um, that was a complaint, as I say, by, made by Sevillian booksellers and printings, uh, printers in 1560. But in 1622, in the next century, when the Spanish crown forbade printing Spanish texts abroad, in an attempt to protect the national printing offices, it was the Venetian printers, the one who complained, and the one who wrote to the Spanish king to complain about this new law that was damaging their business. So we see this internationalization on the, on the book trade. Uh, it is also important to remember that although the printing presses spread all over Europe, not all the places played the same role in this new industry. According to Rangela Nuovo, for instance, Italy, together with Germany and France, was where the world of the printed book was constructed. Uh, indeed, the production and trade of books was organized in a transnational system for an early stage. And in that system, in that geography of the European book uh, industry, Spain always had a secondary role. And we have to all keep that in mind, especially from the mid 16th century. And there's a a huge difference then. Uh, so, as I said, between 1550 and 1650, the geography of books underwent a substantial change in Europe. Italy, especially Venice, progressively lost its preeminence, while Greek publishing centers were growing in Central and Northern Europe, such as Paris or Antwerp, although they knew, obviously, their ups and downs. Um, what I'm trying to see is how we can reflect that in Seville, or how can we see that in the case of Seville. So what do we find in that city? Uh, during the first half of the 16th century, uh, the main book production and trade center in Spain was Seville, indeed. It was the biggest city in the country, of the country, as well as being the center for the Castilian monopoly with the Americas, the Carrera de Indias. Uh, it has been studied by Clive Griffin and Pedro Rueda, so I won't say much about that. Uh, I would say that uh, from Seville, the Kronbergers supply books for the local market and New Spain, where they also sent one of their employees, uh, Giovanni Paoli, as you know, to establish the first printing press in Mexico City. They even had the monopoly for sending books and primers to New Spain until 1550. In spite of the complaints of other civilian printers and booksellers that wrote to the king saying that if he broke the monopoly, they could send uh, more economic books and printing presses to the Americas. Uh, indeed, his monopoly was finished by 1550, but it's interesting to see how these booksellers that were previously complaining and trying to get into that business, they, they participated in the, in the Carrera de Indias, but they could not Mm, they didn't manage to take it all, as the Kronbergers did. Because during the 1550s and 1560s, the situation changed. First of all, the economic crisis drove many printing offices to close in Seville. The inflation encouraged the importation of books from abroad, Italy, France, low countries. And at the same time, the political and religious development brought the book industry under closer scrutiny by the Inquisition all their authorities too, but especially the Inquisition. We have to remember that 
At that time, they were discovered in Seville and Valladolid, two groups of allied Lutherans. Um, so it was a very problematic time. Also, it's the time when the first index of prohibited books was uh, published in Spain. So we have the political and religious problems, but also the economical ones. The inflation caused by the Carrera de Indias uh, was show up, show up first in Seville, so it affected a lot to the industry, not only book industry, all kind of industry. In this sense, book industry behaved yes, like other Spanish industries. It was always more economic to import uh, merchandises from abroad than produce, produce that in, in Spain. Uh, indeed, the situation seems to be similar in other Spanish city. So once the Kronberger monopoly ended, um, other Spanish or civilian printers did not take their place. As I said, they participated, but nobody took the Kronberger's place after them. Uh, from the point of view of the, of the book trade, the misfortune of Seville was the fortune of Medina del Campo and its biannual fairs. Uh, in Medina, the book business was controlled by foreigner booksellers specialized in European imports who started to open their shops there around 1530. Uh, from now on, from the mid of, six, of the 16th century, large publishing firms, which behave like multinationals um, that were settled in the main European printing centers, such as the Boyer from Lyon, Bel Air from Antwerp, Junti from Venice, they came to control a good part of the Iberian and American market. And at the same time, books became a merchandise that absorbed large, sorry, large quantity of money from Spain to Europe. Um, and what do the archives tell us about that? Well, first of all, who were the, these booksellers and book merchants living in Seville? According to a census done in 1561 in Seville, uh, there were only six booksellers living in the city, in the neighborhood of San Andres, Triana, and San Salvador. Nevertheless, the research in the city archives offers us a very different picture. I have found, by now, around 375 booksellers, printers, and apprentices yeah, for these uh, 80 years. Um, well, it's true also that the census is just from one year, but still, uh, only in that year we know much more booksellers and, and printers in Seville. Uh, and that's are only the ones that are neighbors uh, in the city. We also find many others that visited Seville for different purposes, traveling to the Americas, uh, making business in the city, etc. Sometimes, obviously, it's hard to distinguish between booksellers, printers, binders. There's not a specialization. But in general, we can say that booksellers and book merchants uh, double the number of printers. I have around 220 booksellers or book merchants, depending. It's also the, to distinguish between booksellers and book merchants is librero and mercader de libros is not easy either. Um, sometimes they use both. Theoretically, the book merchant is the one that wholesaled, and the bookseller is the one that binded uh, books and have the, uh, the shop. But again, it's confusing the documentation. So around 220 booksellers and book merchants, around four, four 44 apprentices and around 110 printers for this period. Indeed, it's interesting to observe how after 1560, the number of booksellers and book merchants increased while the number of printers decreased, pointing to a concentration of the book business in the hands of those book merchants, especially those who were connecting with European publishing centers. This group of almost 400 people, they formed a very heterogeneous group uh, that did not create a guild to defend their interests or to work uh, for their life. Um, it's interesting that because in other cities in the Crown of Aragon, as you know, the Crown of Castile and the Crown of Aragon and the one of Navarra, they kept their own laws, although they have the same monarch. And it's interesting to see how in the Crown of Aragon, cities such as Zaragoza or Barcelona, they had a bookseller guild already in the 16th century, while in Castile, the first one, as far as I know, is the one created in Madrid in 1611. So I always, I believe that 
in Seville, they were not interested in um, creating a guild because they, they was not interested in being controlled by any institution. The fight is always to, to being controlled. By. But the thing is that they don't have. Although they had obviously common interest and um, common character, characteristic. First of all, most of them lived in the same neighborhood around the cathedral in Genova Street, already mentioned by Stan, uh, that is not only the religious, but also the political and economical center of the city. Again, printers behave in a different way. Many of them lived there, but we find printers more spread around the city in different places. It's also a world without a specialization uh, in the inventories of, bo of bookshops that we can find, we see any kind of text. There is no matter how big or small the shops were. We find anyway a, a kind of evolved, obviously. Uh, especially in the spiritual literature, especially the vernacular spiritual literature changed a lot through this period. Because this, we have all these uh, spiritual books by Francisco de Osuna and this kind of authors that were um, banned in the index. And then we have this new wave of counter-reformist authors, Ignatius of Loyola, Teresa of, uh, of Avila, this kind of people that became quite successful because they knew how to adapt their work. Sometimes they even had problems with the Inquisition at the beginning, but they knew how to adapt their work to the new uh, situation, and they succeeded. And so it's the kind of people that we find together with any other kind of books, obviously. Um, well, in this huge amount of data, what I have tried to do is to, to establish some different levels within this uh, group of people. I find uh, first a top level uh, in which we can find the most powerful book merchants and a few printers. Always books merchants are the ones that dominate the business in the city. After, uh, uh, is that, it's interesting because in the first half of the century, we don't find that. We find the Kronbergers that were mainly printers dominating the situation. But now it's indicative of the, the problem of Spanish industry, really, book industry or any kind of industry. So uh, we found these most powerful book merchants and a few printers that dominated the market, invested in their own or other uh, printers' editions, wholesale books, and had a very good standard of life. Uh, they were also the most, more active in the defense of their interest. In this group, we can include some of the men who arrived to the city after 1560, uh, linked to these European book companies, previously settled in other Spanish cities, like Francisco de Aguilar, who came from Medina del Campo, Andrea Pescioni, we'll talk, uh, talk about him later, Pedro de Portonaris from Lyon, Juan Belero, and in the 17th century, uh, Cardón or Kerbergio, members of those two families. Um, sometimes they created uh, dynasties, like the Mejia, studied by Pedro Rueda or the Belair. Um, their investments were more ambitious and risky, although never too ambitious, I have to say, <laughs> but more than the other. And they, were, they have links with the city banks and the main book center in Spain and Europe. Francisco de Aguilar is a good example of this, and we know a lot about him because he died quite young, and we have the inventory of his, of his job and his will. Uh, he died in 1574. Uh, for instance, in his inventory, we have almost of the edition of the, the first edition of the first Italian Spanish uh, dictionary, mm. because he paid the edition. Uh, that was printed, it was printed in Seville by García Escribano, written by Cristóbal de las Casas, a Sevillian writer, and Francisco de Aguilar paid the edition, so it was almost all uh, the copies were in his shop when he died. And he had uh, an open account in Medina del Campo, and when he was in prison, for a, something that is also related to the Counter-Reformation, uh, it was Pedro de Mor the banker Pedro de Morga, the one who interceded for, for him. He was in, I have time. He was in prison because 
as you know, in the Council of Trent, the, um, the Catholic liturgy was changed. The, the, it was what is called in Spanish the Nuevo Rezado, all these new liturgical books that had to be produced and sold over the Catholic world. And in Spain, or in Castile, Philip II gave the monopoly of the distribution of those books of the Nuevo Rezado to the, to the Escorial, the monastery of El Escorial. Um, so the monks from the monastery, what they did was to uh, make agreement with local uh, uh, booksellers to sell the books. Francisco de Aguilar was selling those books without the, uh, that agreement. So he was selling or trying to sell legal books, but illegally. So he was trying to smuggling with legal books. Um, that's an interesting issue also because of the intervention of the Inquisition in that. So he went to prison, but not the inquisitorial prison, but to the royal prison because it was a problem with the royal authority. And, and that, it is in that moment when the banker Pedro de Morga interceded for him. So uh, those men, those men in the top level of the profession, they were frequently involved in the Carrera de Indias. And their social, social circle is that of the wealthy merchants, uh, bankers, silver, silversmiths, and all this kind of people. We find another second group of booksellers and a few printers too, who despite having less ambitious business, they still enjoy, enjoy a good status within the, their colleagues. Those people are mainly Spaniards. But again, it's not easy to distinguish sometimes between them. Almost, almost all the individuals included in these two groups lived in the, near the cathedral, in the street Genova, and they are the ones who appear in the common claims made through the 16th century by a civilian book professional to the crown and other authorities. They make some medical claims about taxes, about well, when they were smuggling books or when they were not following the law, so they made several different claims. Um, those are the people who appear in, in those documents. Then we have other workers who run small shops and worked for other, or work for other people. Most of the printers uh, here, they have small shops or more, small printing offices. Um, sometimes they were living in the, in the house of, other, of their employers, of their employers, obviously. And finally, we have also peddlers and blind men that constitute the lowest but not less important level of the book distribu distribution in the city. Sometimes it's, ha it's hard to follow in them to find evidence, but we have a few about, about these people. Mm, as I've been saying, among book merchants and printers established in Seville uh, in this period, we find a good number of foreigners. Uh, Seville indeed has been described as a, as a powerful magnet for foreigners. And in this sense, booksellers and printers are just another example of that. It was a quite cosmopolitan city at that time. Not now, but at that time it was. Um, they were attracted mainly by the highest salaries. That were that something that had changed also. <laughs> <laughs> in that time, it was like that. So, um, uh, from the arriving of the printing press to the city and during the first half of the 16th century, German printers had a dominant position within foreigners and within the industry in general, especially thanks to the Kronberger family, but there were other cases too. In the second half of the century, this German preeminence has finished and what we found are, we find Italian, Flemish and French that take the place of German people, although the importance changed over the time. The Italian colony was the, the biggest in Seville already from the Middle Age. Um, from an early moment, we find Italian booksellers and printers in the city, like La Bezaris and others. But um, the first Italian books, book merchant that is a really important one in the city is probably Andrea Peccioni, who arrived uh, in, in the second half of the century. It's a very interesting case because uh, he, he was born in Florence and he was already in Medina del Campo in 1555. His presence in Seville seems to be linked to the expansion of the Junti family, 
that was one of the most important Venetian publishing firms, known as the Junta in Spain, and who were also native of Florence, like Pescioni was. So, indeed, uh, the first step in Seville of Andrea Pescioni in 1560, Ooh, already? Okay. were linked to Leonardo Nicolozzi, another Florentine, who was the agent of the Junti in Spain, and they were bringing books from Venice to Seville. When he was settled down in Seville, Pescioni lived in the street Genova, as I said. He married the daughter of a silk merchant, who gave him a very good dowry, and established social bonds with the city. He was the godfather of his college uh, children. He was a member of a brotherhood, and he was very active in the Carrera de Indias. He even owned uh, ships that were in the fleet in 1580. And he also tried to establish his own agents in other cities of Andalusia, like Osuna. That was the capital of the Duke of Osuna, and there was a university in that city. So what he did was send his own agent to work there. He, been, he funded some editions, and he even created a company from printing books for a while. But around 600, the year 1600, he has left all this book business because he had a position in the aduana, and he died after that. So being a wealthy man, but leaving behind all the book business. Well, I have only so I skipped this part. By the end of the century, and uh, the beginning of the 17th century, Flemish and French merchants were gaining importance, uh, such as the Belair from Antwerp or the Cardon from Lyon. By that time, Medina del Campo was also losing its role, taken by Madrid, but civilian booksellers still managed to, to solve some of the problems thanks to the American market. Um, in those years, as I said, for instance, we have the, some Flemish book merchants arriving to the city, mainly the people linked to the Calvergio family from Antwerp. We find, for instance, in 1618, the brothers Pedro and Justo Calvergio, that were in Seville, and they were receiving books from the Jesuit friar Pedro de Aguilar in behalf of the Coimbras uh, College. Uh, the books that they received were supposed to be sold uh, without any profit for the books merchants. It's weird, but probably they were using that link with the Jesuits to find any other, uh, another kind of business or to, to purchase other books. It's also interesting because all these books are clearly counter-reformist titles. They have Suarez de Religiones, Suarez de Censuris, Suarez de Trinitate, Vita Christi, etc. One year later, they were sued by a French book merchant, Jacques Cardon from Lyon, who claimed that the Flemish brothers had alzado sus bienes y ausentadose maliciosamente. So took the goods and left the city. Although Cardon finally accepted to wait for the payment, 2,475 reales, while Pedro Calvergio offered a part of his books as a deposit. And again, the list is mainly uh, an example of counter-reformist literature in Latin and Spanish. Um, analyzing notarial records, the notarial records archives in Seville, we can also see how the Spanish book trade networks underwent through substantial change during this period. Uh, still up? Okay, I'll be brief. Uh, in the peninsula, within the peninsula, during the second half of the 16th century, Civilian book merchants developed their networks in Medina del Campo, Salamanca, and Valladolid, mainly. And also in Granada and Osuna, in the case of Andalusia. At the end of the century and the beginning of the 17th century, other cities appear in the horizon, such as Alcalá de Henares, Madrid, obviously, but also Zaragoza and Barcelona, in the crown of Aragon. There, in Barcelona, for instance, we have the Cormella family that were printing and sending books to Seville, sometimes through other Catalan merchants, established in the city, sometimes through religious orders, such as the 19 boxes of Latin and Spanish books that Antonio de Toro and Gabriel Ramos bought in Seville to the Cormellas through the Dominican convent in the city, or sometimes traveling directly to Seville. Uh, those are, for instance, this Cormella and the Bonilla from Zaragoza are mentioned in the memorial dado por Joan Serrano de Vargas, 
a printing pr uh, printer in, the, in, civilian, in Seville that was complaining about the links between corrupted officials in Madrid and these families, like the Cormellas and the Bonilla, who were taking the, the business. And in the archives in Seville, we can find the same, the same names. So finally, have a minute only? One, one yeah. more. Yeah, one minute. I, just, I would like to add some information about the collaboration between pro, uh, book professionals and the inquisitions. Because despite those printers and booksellers that suffer, and did suffer in inquisition, per, in the inquisition persecution, um, Clive Griffin again has studied some of the cases, we find that many of them, especially booksellers, collaborated with the Inquisition in several ways. Uh, they needed to work with the Inquisition in their everyday life, so it was good to, to have a, a good relation, it was crucial for them. The most obvious way to collaborate was to become a familiar, this layman who assisted the Inquisition tribunals and received some privileges, um, like taxes, cessation, etc. It was also a proof of the limpieza de sangre. And I have found in Seville at least two important booksellers who were familiares of the, of the Inquisition. I have found examples in other cities, so it's not a strange thing. Uh, in Granada and in Medina del Campo, so we found quite of them. Uh, the interesting thing is that one of them, for instance, was Alonso Montero, a bookseller married to the daughter of a colleague brother-in-law of the printer Pedro de Ocharte, they were married to two sisters, and he was familiar for several years, although the Inquisition has such suspicions about his limpieza. The interesting thing is that mm, among the benefit that he took from this collaboration, probably is, probably is also the contract that he signs for the distribution of the Nuevo Rezado in Seville and later in Andalusia. And it's interesting because the Inquisition was not directly involved in that business. But if we study the practice, I mean, legally, it was something that had to do with the Escorial and book merchants. So it was the friars of the, the Escorial, the ones signing the, the contract. But if we see the practice and we see all the names and all the intermediaries, we find the Inquisition there. We have, find, for instance, Pedro de Morga, who was a banker, but he was also in charge of the Inquisition uh, accounts. We find uh, the bishop of, I think, Segovia, that was also linked to the Inquisition and was linked to this business. And we find that Alonso Montero, the familiar of the Inquisition in Seville, was the bookseller that managed to get the contract. But in Granada, we have, we have the same case, and also in Murcia. I'm not sure that we would find more cases, but I have these three cases that prove how profitable it could be to collaborate with the, with the Inquisition for book merchants. And I leave it here. Sorry for the chaos. I know it's a lot of information, but thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Let me say how exciting it is to be part of uh, such a multilingual conference on the early modern Atlantic. Um, I'm a, a literary scholar uh, working on the transatlantic English language book trade of the late 18th and early 19th century, and I have particular interest in how the history of material texts and the history of aesthetics are interrelated. I'm currently working on a book project about the print culture of the early black Atlantic, provisionally titled Early Black Writing and the Book. John Morant is the subject of my talk today. He's a key figure in this larger project. So before I get to him, I want to provide a scholarly context in order to highlight the stakes of my claims. So I'll just describe this project to you. My current project offers a new account of the production and dissemination of black printed texts in a half century after two books first raised the issue of black authorship in the Anglophone world. Phyllis Wheatley's Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, published in London in 1773, and The Letters of Ignatius Sancho, an African, published in London in 1782. These were the first full-length books written in English by authors of African descent. Their appearance represented a watershed moment in the history of print. Book publication, as opposed to more ephemeral kinds of printing, made black authors available for the first time as specimens of the African mind and therefore as evidence either to support or oppose the institution of slavery. Wheatley's poems and Sancho's letters forced readers throughout the Atlantic world to decide if there was a necessary irony 
in the enslavement of an author. Thomas Jefferson famously dismissed both Wheatley and Sancho in notes on the state of Virginia. This was a question that inaugurated a wide-ranging discussion about the relationship between racial difference and the phenomenology of print, and that inextricably entangled the volatile discourses of freedom, slavery, literary genius, typicality, and representation. In recent years, a group of energetic scholars have revisited the production and reception of the early black print archive from the perspective of the methodologies of book history. For example, in a recent edited collection, Early African American Print Culture from 2012, Laura Langer Cohen and Jordan Alexander Stein remind scholars of African American literature of the importance of the distinction between print and print culture. Distinctions undoubtedly that are familiar to you. Print, they say, is a technology that fixes impressions while print culture designates, quote, a world in which print both integrates with other practices and assumes a life of its own. Turning to print culture directs our attention, quote, to the ways that print affects and sometimes effects personhood circulated to unintended readers is subject to reiteration and reappropriation and allows equally for representation and misrepresentation. As far as African American writing is concerned, such a perspective is particularly relevant, they argue, to the earliest text of the tradition, quote, whose meandering plots, numerous plagiarisms, and multiple rewritings defy nearly any notion of textual stability. In emphasizing instability, Cohen and Stein implicitly draw upon and revise John Sikora's famous metaphor of occlusion, outlined in his 1987 article in Callaloo, that the slave narrative's dependence on white institutional manipulation and control seals each black message in a white envelope. Sikora's metaphor, black message, white envelope, articulates the difficulty of forging the print identity link early black narratives urge upon readers on a rhetorical level. While Sikora and others have traditionally seen such difficulties as an almost insurmountable problem, that is, as a formidable bar that blocks access to the subaltern experience, Many working now in African American print culture take such difficulties as a point of departure. The fundamental questions this scholarly community now asks are invested less in racial authenticity than in the puzzling complexities of print culture. No longer conceiving of early black texts as sealed within white envelopes, we are now accustomed to find multiple messages in multiple envelopes, black and white, sometimes sealed, sometimes cracked open, and always implicated in print culture's worldliness and contingency. My own work breaks new ground in this field by making five interrelated claims inspired by a media-specific approach to the early black print archive. I'll summarize those claims briefly before I turn to Morant. As I walk through them, though, keep in mind that the field of African American studies has long been invested in its earliest texts because during the Enlightenment, writing itself was a high-stakes process of mediated expression by which authors of African descent announced their humanity in a Western culture that privileged literacy. As Henry Louis Gates Jr. writes in The Signifying Monkey, quote, the slave wrote not primarily to demonstrate humane letters, but to demonstrate his or her membership in the human community. Early black authors demonstrated such membership through writing their personal narratives and polemics against slavery and the slave trade. In the age of Descartes, human Kant, Gates argues writing was, quote, the visible sign of reason. A focus on the destabilizing complexities of print culture then, which often leaves authorship aside, seems to undo the important political work that early black writing has long been heralded for performing. And the point here is that while all of us in this room are historians and theorists of material texts, African American studies has until recently been uncomfortable with such methodologies. Okay, so my five claims. Briefly, I argue that black readers and writers displayed a practical, conceptual, and formal interest in print as a medium capable of disrupting the racialized public sphere. In an 1809 oration written to commemorate the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, William Hamilton declared, quote, I hold in my hand a specimen of African genius, as he pointed his audience to a printed pamphlet by another black writer in order to, quote, put our enemies to the blush. As readers, early black writers immersed themselves in transatlantic print culture, adopting, adapting, and rejecting a wide range of views. As authors, they attended carefully to textual revision and book promotion, collaborated with white editors and amanuenses, exploited the performative effects of circulation, and theorized within the text they wrote about the political efficacy of print itself. Second, I think the early black archive must be understood with an attention to the politics of format. 
Both the content and impact of early black writing was shaped by the physical form that brought it to readers. Only an attention to the size, heft, and practical, practical usability of the material text can register, for example, the publication of Wheatley's and Sancho's full-length books as significant moments in the history of print. Broad-sized pamphlets, such as the one Hamilton holds in his hand, occasional sermons and bound books carry discrete cultural, political, and economic meanings, both for black authors and their audience. Three, scholars have not yet fully reckoned with the textual mutability of this archive, especially works by writers who revised from edition to edition and whose books were altered in widely disseminated unauthorized reprints, including those by Wheatley Morant, Alad Equiano, Otaba Kuguano, and David Walker. Textual instability was a defining feature of, the early black, of early black writing, and only meticulous comparisons among various editions can reveal the prerogatives of reprinters, as well as the full significance of these authors' engagement with the publication process. Shown in Wheatley's constant revisions to her poetry, uh, John Morant's expansion of his narrative, and I'll be talking about that later, and Olada Equiano's painstaking revision of his own interesting narrative from 1789 to 1794 over the course of nine discrete editions. Four early black printed texts were not autonomous acts of writing submitted to the Enlightenment's Court of Appeal. They emerged instead from networks of collaboration and association whose political and religious agenda influenced their production, consumption, and reception. The British evangelical group connected to the Countess of Huntington and George Whitfield ushered many 18th century texts to the press, including those of Wheatley and Morant, while abolitionist movements in Britain buoyed writers like Equiano and Cuguano. Meanwhile, African churches and Masonic lodges were responsible for many publications in this period from New York and Philadelphia. I am thus interested in the social life of printed texts as commodities whose exchange value was determined more often by the intimacies of patronage than by the anonymous marketplace. Finally, I approach this archive and its reception with a thoroughly transatlantic perspective, one this conference obviously promotes. Much writing we think of as African American was published in London under the wing of British patrons, while texts of an ostensibly local nature published in the United States emerged from and participated in a broadly Anglophone print culture defined by traveling texts. This transatlantic framework is especially important before the 1830s, when the abolition of slavery in the British Empire and the rise of immediate emancipation movements in the United States ushered in a new era of African American writing focused squarely on the urgency of total abolition. Okay, now on to John Morant. John Morant's narrative of the Lord's wonderful dealings was first published in London in 1785. Morant was born in New York in 1755 and as a young child moved with his mother to Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. I'll give you a short biography of him. At the age of 13, he experienced a religious conversion inspired by George Whitfield. During the American Revolution, Morant was pressed into the British Navy, and after the war, he moved to London, where he worked for a clothing merchant. In 1785, he was ordained at Bath as a minister into the Huntington Connection, a sect of Methodism led by Whitfield's patron, the Countess of Huntington. His narrative was published under the auspices of this group of evangelicals as a record of his ordination sermon, which told the story of his life and conversion. Soon after his ordination, he went to Morant went to Nova Scotia as a missionary. In 1787, he moved to Boston where he became the chaplain, chaplain to the first African Masonic Lodge founded by Prince Hall in 1784. He returned to England in 1790 and continued to work as a minister until the, his death a year later. A narrative of the Lord's wonderful dealings tells the story of his early religious conversion and remarkable captivity among the Cherokee Indians in South Carolina, where he successfully converted the Cherokee chief. It was one of the most widely popular captivity narratives of the late 18th century, of any captivity narrative, and probably the most widely reprinted early Black Atlantic text, receiving more than 50 printings throughout the mid-19th century. In the hands of unauthorized reprinters, the narrative was sometimes repackaged to highlight its most marketable aspects. Here's a title page from a reprint there. In some reprints, Morant's race, a black, was deleted from the title page to emphasize the sensational content of its captivity narrative, this one emphasizing his conversion of the Cherokees. I am interested today in the narrative's textual history, which has two important phases. Its initial printing, reprinting, and revision in a number of editions in London 
in the summer of 1785, as well as its subsequent reprinting in the early 19th century. In examining the text of the narrative's earliest editions and its later reprintings, I shall investigate the questions of authority endemic to early black printed texts, although I'm prepared to discuss the ways in which this case study is sort of typical of the period's print culture more generally. I will also argue that we cannot understand the narrative's popularity without a full reckoning with its earliest publication history. And I'll conclude finally with a rather interesting point about the narrative's reprint history, which was far more geographically limited than previous scholars have claimed. The narrative emerged from Morant's relationship with a white amanuensis, William Aldridge, a minister and a member of the Huntington Connection. Aldridge was present when Morant was ordained at Bath in 1785, when he gave an account of his life from which the narrative is partly drawn. Here's another image of the title page. The title page records that the narrative was, quote, taken down from Morant's own relation, arranged, corrected, and published by the Reverend Mr. Aldridge. In his preface, Aldrich wrote, quote, I have always preserved Mr. Morant's ideas, though I could not his language. With only some exceptions, scholars working on Morant have bracketed the issue of this text's instability to forward interpretations implicitly grounded on the idea that print offers a view into the black Atlantic experience. What allows in the main for fixing Morant's identity to print is the existence of a unique fourth edition of the narrative whose title page grants Morant direct control. There's an image from the fourth edition. This fourth edition was, quote, enlarged by Mr. Morant and printed with permission for his sole benefit with notes explanatory. Most modern editors, including Vincent Coretta, Adam Potke, and Sandra Burr, and Joanna Brooks, and John Salient, reprint this edition, reasonably, because his, his author's name is on it, which, significantly, which is significantly altered from the first. These editors have, however, simplified the text's evolution as a full investigation and interpretation of its textual genealogy reveals, which is what I'll do now. The first and second editions of the narrative were, were printed by Gilbert and Plummer um, in, in London and contain the bulk of the text, which I will now briefly summarize. And this is the text on your left. I'm going to summarize what's in the narrative. John Morant, a youth in Charleston, experiences a sudden conversion during a George Whitfield sermon. Persecuted for his religiosity, he leaves home and falls in with the Cherokees, where he is marked for execution. While among the Cherokees, an episode occurs that Henry Louis Gates discusses in his famous chapter of the signifying monkey devoted to the trope of the talking book. The Cherokee king's daughter, having seen Morant talk to his Bible, but not understanding the function of prayer, is puzzled and disappointed when Morant's Bible does not speak to her. Morant is saved from execution by his remarkable new power of conversion and returns home, where his family initially doesn't recognize him, but then accepts, accepts him back into the community. He proceeds to have various adventures during the American Revolution and moves to England. The narrative ends with the announcement that he's bound for Nova Scotia as a missionary. The only mention of Morant's race in the text of this edition occurs on its title page, which identifies him as a black. The text of Morant's authorized edition differs in a number of ways. This is the text on your right. The title page signals his direct involvement in the publication, as I have already emphasized, although it still mentions that it was arranged, corrected, and published by Aldridge. There are changes to a scene of domestic reconciliation, minor substantive revisions throughout, footnotes that do not appear in the first edition, as well as significant new episodes towards the narrative's end including the death of a pious young child, Mary Scott, and a concluding hymn from Dr. Watts. It is the only edition of the narrative that includes any mention of slavery, a violent episode on a plantation outside Charleston, which introduces Morant's race into the main text of the narrative for the first time. It is impossible to know exactly the process through which this text transformed from its first edition to this fourth edition, since no relevant manuscripts or correspondence survive. Brooks and Salient, the editors, speculate that Morant's enlarged edition might even predate the first edition, and that Aldridge, quote, may have condensed Morant's account to make it more palatable to a white audience. However, two early editions of the narrative that have been overlooked provide new evidence that complicate the notion of Morant's edition as a clear authorial intervention, 
even as they provide a more precise picture of its relationship to those edition Aldridge apparently controlled. These editions were published after the first edition, but before Marant's fourth edition. All of them appears within a single month. Okay, so now this will, this will be a textual genealogy, and we've got the first edition on the top here, and now we've got this third edition editors have perhaps seen, but not taken account of. The narrative's third edition, also printed by Gilbert and Plummer, the original printers, includes five new footnotes that provide authenticating information and address implausible details, all written in Marant's first-person voice. These footnotes address a detail about Indian torture, a moment when the Cherokee king had appeared to understand English, Marant's depiction of the king's riding horseback during the siege of Charleston, a, Whit a Whitfieldian minister mentioned early in the text, and Marant's statements about his work under a merchant in London. The inclusion of these footnotes in Marant's author's edition has led editors to wrongly assume they appeared there first, when they are in fact the product of this earlier stage of the text's evolution. As we have seen, Marant's text advertises itself as the fourth edition. There is, however, a competing fourth edition, also enlarged from earlier editions, which was issued under the same authority as the previous editions, namely Aldridge. The texts of these two competing fourth editions differ from earlier editions and from each other. Aldridge's fourth edition was printed again by Gilbert and Plummer. We see that's consistent. Marant used another printer, R. Hawes. Different dates affixed to their final pages suggest they may have been prepared within days. Aldridge's fourth edition ends with an attestation from the cotton merchants who employed Marant in London, and it's dated August 16th, 1785. Marant's fourth edition ends instead with a new paragraph bidding adieu to his London friends, signed and dated two days later, August 18th, 1785. According to Marant's subsequent journal and other publication, the precise day he left London for America. This inspires a few questions. What was the negotiation or the struggle over the narrative's fourth edition? Which in the weeks or even days before Marant left for Nova Scotia produced two competing texts from different printers, prefaced with two widely different titular claims to authority. What role did Marant's account of slavery play in this negotiation, which split into two directions the narrative's textual history? Internal evidence provides a number of clues. Aldridge's edition represents an earlier state of the text, as suggested by the fact that all the changes that appear in that edition also appear in Marant's, while the reverse is not the case. Changes common to both editions include entirely new paragraphs, new footnotes, and minor substantive changes, some of which increase its ver verisimilitude. I'll give you one minor textual change. In all earlier editions, Marant is, quote, struck to the ground at the Whitfield meeting, quote, for about 24 minutes. But in both fourth editions, he lay there for, quote, near half an hour. This makes the event more plausible in its account, if not as a reality, since if Marant was indeed knocked senseless by Whitfield, he could hardly have recalled the exact duration. A new paragraph in both editions specifies Marant's travels during the American Revolution, as he goes to, quote, Wills Town and Borough Town and Dorchester Town. The most significant change is the addition of the death of Mary Scott, an episode of about 700 words, which narrates a fairly conventional scene of childhood piety in anticipation of heaven. This new scene domesticates the religiosity of a narrative otherwise filled with adventure and the conversion scenes of the Cherokees, bringing Marant's role as a witness to God's wonderful dealings into the home. Changes exclusive to Marant's edition include some additional minor changes, more involved revisions, including the rewriting of his homecoming scene, and as I have mentioned, the new episode about slavery. I'll describe that episode to you now. In that episode, Marant teaches Watts hymns and prayer to quote little Negro children in religious meetings near a plantation outside Charleston. When the mistress discovers this, she becomes violently angry and convinces a reluctant husband to beat the offending slaves. Marant himself is spared a beating, he tells us, because he's free, he's a free black, he's not enslaved himself. The master appears perturbed by both Marant and his wife. Quote, he told me afterwards I had spoiled all his Negroes, Marant writes, but could not help acknowledging that they did their tasks sooner than others would, have, others would who were not instructed. 
They kept their own fields in better order than the others. The episode rails against the violence and cruelty of slavery without, however, being straightforwardly abolitionist. Morant indeed tells the master, quote, that the blood of those poor Negroes which he had spilt that morning would be required by God at his hands, unquote. But at the end of the story, after the mistress's death, quote, her husband gave them liberty to meet together as before. Morant writes, adding with only a touch of irony, I have since heard that it was made very useful to him. This fascinating episode folds a depiction of racialized violence and terror into, this, into a story of the triumph of piety over persecution. Quote, they nevertheless continued their meetings, although in such imminent danger, Marant writes, by which it appears that the work was of God. It introduces incendiary content about slavery into an otherwise marketable narrative of captivity, conversion, and religious deliverance. Further, it addresses Marant's race not merely as the kind of descriptor that adorns the title page, a black, but narratively to the drama of his being spared a flogging. Marant's race, no longer a flat, abstract category without perceivable impact on the story of his life, is now put to, put to, the, put to work as the stuff of plot. As such, it takes on a powerful new three-dimensionality. We can see why Aldridge might have found reason to object. We might imagine two circumstances that led to the publication of these two fourth editions. One pictures Marant defiantly taking his narrative to another printer without Aldridge's knowledge and stamping the title page with the sign of his own authority, sanctioned with his own permission. A more plausible story, I think, distributes control in a far more murky fashion. The narrative's textual history suggests, through a kind of retroactive logic, that Marant played a larger role in the earlier stages of the text than the decisive break this fourth edition seems to represent. All the minor changes to Marant's edition are consistent with the kinds of changes that distinguish Aldridge's third and fourth editions. The two new episodes share a similar anecdotal structure and a peculiar vagueness of temporality, and in fact begin with exactly the same phrase. Quote, about this time I was an eyewitness to a remarkable conversion of a child, Morant writes about Mary Scott. And then, quote, about this time I went with my brother, who was a house carpenter, to repair a plantation, he writes, about teaching slaves. The episodes are narratively interchangeable. This suggests to me an extended process of composition and revision during which the representation of slavery was raised as only the most contentious among a, among a number of concerns. A further consideration of Morant's title page suggests not defiance, but instead an attempt to circumscribe the meaning of publication. This edition, as we said, was printed for Morant's sole benefit. Is that okay? paying attention here to that part of the title page, an isolating phrase that elides the publicness print publication usually processes, promises. Such isolation is reinforced by the book's status as a self-published venture printed for the author. We misread the phrase with permission, furthermore, if we think it refers to Marant as an author. It refers instead, I think, to Gilbert and Plummer, the printers of Aldridge's editions. And it is meant to assure readers this is not a pirated text, there's no addition that this narrative was ever copyrighted, but courtesy of the trade rules may have considered it the rightful property of Gilbert and Plummer. So this printed with permission of them. <coughs> Morant's authorized edition was authorized in this view, not by its author, but by the narrative's original printer. In a remarkable irony that breaks down a clear distinction between authorized and unauthorized texts. That is to say, Morant's edition was printed with the assurance that it wouldn't compete in the market with other texts of the narrative. Printed, that is, so long as it didn't circulate. The legacy of the narrative appears to bear this conclusion out. There has been some considerable confusion among scholars who have considered the text's subsequent reprinting in the 19th century. Some reprints include footnotes, some of them don't. Some of them reprint the story of the death of Mary Scott, some of them don't. None of them include the episode about slavery. Reprints have been referred to as expurgated texts, the result of a conspiracy of whitewashing or as being brought together in a seemingly haphazard manner. My examination so far of 16 reprints and all the bibliographical records suggest, however, that subsequent reprints were derived from Aldridge's texts, not Marant's. And here we're back to our genealogy. The first edition of a narrative that significantly altered the book's title page, including his race, was published in 1787 with no printer named on its title page, a true piracy. It uses the text of the first and second editions, as do many 
derivatives from this. And the, the arrow here is just the text I'm mentioning at the bottom here use the text of that original edition. All other reprints derive from Aldridge's fourth edition down to the mid 19th century. I might mention that the JCB has about five reprints of this with this textual genealogy in it from London, Dublin, Cork, and Yarmouth. Morant's enlarged fourth edition, used almost universally in teaching and scholarship, was not reprinted until modern editors rediscovered it. Insofar as reprinting can be a guide then, our understanding of the narrative's wild popularity must account for the fact that Morant's depiction of slavery played no part in it. It may have been popular, I think, precisely for this reason. I want to conclude now with a point about circulation. As I have implied, the wide reprinting of the narrative has served as an index to its popularity. Gates and others have pointed to dozens of editions that appeared in London, Dublin, Leeds, Halifax, and elsewhere. Later scholars of the Black Atlantic have argued that the publication history of this text, like the life of its author, exemplifies the transatlantic circulatory roots of exchange that define the early modern world. However, I can say now with some certainty that there is no evidence Morant's narrative was ever reprinted in North America. The Halifax editions that Gates and so many subsequent scholars point to were printed not in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where Morant himself resided in the 1780s, but in Halifax, England. All of them by a single printer from that city, John Nicholson, who, as James N. Green has shown, also printed texts by Equiano and Wheatley in the 1810s, long after all these authors' deaths. The first Nicholson edition was printed in 1808 and derived from this earlier edition that elided Morant's race on his title page. This edition was very successful. As you can see, it went through many editions itself. Many of these Halifax editions printed by Nicholson are misidentified in archives still, including the New York Public Library and other places, and their North American provenance is often cited in scholarship. There's much more to be learned about what we could fairly call a Morant revival in the 1810s, but the first thing is to acknowledge that it was not transatlantic. But I want to end by questioning the way literary scholars in particular often rely on, rely on reprinting as primary evidence of a text circulation, transatlantic or otherwise. Re reprinting can be accurately described as only the most visible evidence of circulation. As we know, texts traveled across the Atlantic without being reprinted. They were often physically carried and shipped by individuals. I don't need to tell you that. Such texts do not leave imprints of their travels behind. Recall that Morant's authorized edition of the narrative was printed the day he left for Nova Scotia on August 18th, 1785. I said before that Gilbert and Plummer gave Morant permission to use his own edition as long as it didn't circulate. Well, let me modify that statement so long as it didn't circulate in England. I picture Morant printing his own fourth edition and simply taking it with him across the Atlantic, where as a missionary among people of African descent, its powerful depiction of North American slavery may have had the most relevance. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers, and I'd like to ask our, our two other speakers to join us up here. As the program notes, the comment here is by the audience. I do want to say um, I, I appreciated all of these talks, and um, I found some very interesting, very interesting intersections among the three of them. And uh, just I'll, I'll um, say one thing about uh, Joe's very interesting talk, since we only met this morning, frankly, other than by email. And uh, one of my favorite, I, I got my start as a, in this business as a, uh, a, a used bookseller uh, at Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon. And uh, uh, we had a saying uh, when we were there, which is that the only thing rarer than a first edition is a second edition. So uh, thank you for uh, doing an excellent job on that. Um, so I'm going to open it up to um, questions, comments, commentary, et cetera, uh, from the audience. Um, and I'll just uh, play moderator. So anyone who would like to begin. Yes. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, all three of you, for very fascinating and uh, illuminating uh, papers. I have a couple of just sort of specific questions. Um, if you'll indulge, I have a couple of questions. One for um, uh, Professor Von Rosen. Uh, I was curious. Uh, when you talk about the, the kind of change in the, the kinds of size of books that were being uh, printed uh, you know, around after 1650, uh, I was curious to know uh, 
what kinds of books these are, if these are primarily legal or theological texts, and, and also who the readership is of these kinds of texts. So that, that's, that's a very specific question. And I have a, a question for Professor Maillard, which is, um, I'm just curious, you mentioned the first Italian-Spanish dictionary printed uh, in yes. Seville, and I'm curious to know uh, just a little bit more about that. It's an interesting case because, you know, in the kind of in the broader global context at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century, uh, there's, there's a kind of a, a small proliferation of these kinds of vocabulary type books that are sort of informal, sort of how to talk to other people that don't speak your language kinds of books. And there's, there's, a, there's one in Mexico that's a Spanish Nahuatl one, and I recently found a, a Sicilian Spanish one. It's a manuscript case, and it's sort of like how to talk to the Spanish overlords when they come to Sicily. So, uh, you know, so I'm just curious to know when, you know, when, when it was published and what, kind of what's the, what's the kind of the broader context for it. Okay, so um, as far as what we know about the folio volumes, um, I would say most of them, as you already mentioned, would be uh, theological works, although you also have some legal works and in case historical works, but by far the most are theological works, especially the works that actually traveled uh, across the Atlantic. Even there you have percentage, in percentages, even more theological works of that firm that are actually uh, available in, in, uh, in Mexico. And as far as readership goes, yeah, it's always very hard to, to know that, but I, I, the things that have been survived, and that is already, of course, a problem with how, you know, what books have survived and which ones haven't, they are usually the books that, you know, were owned by monasteries, by courts. Um, so there, there are very few, like, private owners that, that we know of, of that are in, in libraries, not like uh, national libraries uh, today. Um, about the dictionary, the vocabulario de las dos lenguas, Toscana y Castellana, if I'm not wrong, remember the title, was, I think it was that. Um, it was published in 1570 in Seville. Uh, there is a facsimile edition uh, from the 90s or early 2000. Uh, it's a very interesting one. So, uh, and the author, Cristóbal de las Casas, if if I'm not wrong, he was the secretary of a nobleman. Um, and well, it's, it, it's normal somehow that the dictionary was published, uh, produced and published in Seville because the Italian community there was huge, especially the Genovese, people from Genova. Um, and, yeah, and it's very interesting the introduction because in the introduction he says, the author says that, uh, what was, I'm trying to, translate a little bit what I remember he said. But he said something that uh, if you learn Italian, you can reach or you can read all the books that Italian has written or translated from to their own languages. So all the classics, for instance, they have already translated them to Italian. So if you learn Italian, you can read those authors. And you can read all, all, all the Italian authors that have written about all kind of subjects. Um, it's said that Andrea Pescioni, the book merchant, was also involved in the writing of the, that dictionary because he was in the same uh, social circle than the author. And Francisco de Aguilar, the publisher, the book merchant who published, who funded the edition, he was also linked to Andrea Pescioni. So this this circle of people, the one who created. But I didn't, I didn't know about the Sicilian one. That's very interesting. And it's only a manuscript. It's, uh, it's hard to know what the date is because it doesn't say the date, but it's mm -hmm. interesting because these kinds of dictionaries always they say something about the kind of cultural expectations of the people who are writing them. Mm -hmm. they, you know, you yeah. look at the Nahuatl Spanish one, and it's all about it's telling Spanish people how to deal with their indigenous under you know their underlings, and so it's all yeah. you know, sort of like word order kind of language. <laughs> Uh, and, and uh, economic stuff, whereas the Sicilian uh, Spanish one is, is, seems to be directed, it's, it's hard to know if it's directed at the Spanish, mm -hmm. you know, like this is how to talk to the Sicilians when you get there, when you 
you know, your device or in your port arrive, or if it's directed to Sicilian uh, kind of upper, you know, kind of, yeah. you know, kind of the upper class Sicilians who might be interacting with the Italians, because it's always, you know, that you get these things like, I heard that the Duke's wife was getting married next week. And, I mean, you know, it's, it's, you, know, yeah. you know, these kinds of things. Well, in this case, is the, is the target are Spaniards. And also, you have to consider that the, the dictionary is not Italian, it's Tuscan language. Toscana, Castellana. So it's also related to this high Italian lang le language, the Petrarch language. Um, probably also related to the human, humanist group in Seville that were involved in the in the study of Spanish language, but in the, for instance, the humanist group, uh, civilian group, they published the, po uh, the poems by Garcilaso de la Vega, the one who introduced the sonnets in Spanish language, one of the, one of the first who succeeded in that. Uh, so they were uh, studying um, this more avant-garde Spanish po poetry at the time that is the one linked to Petrarch and the Italian uh, models. So it, I think it's in that context that the dictionary was produced, beside all this uh, Italian community in Seville that was huge. And so it was, it was needed, the Italian, for merchants and for intellectuals, for uh, scholars. So it's that the target. Just, just to highlight one of the intersections between some of these papers and some of the thinking that's going on in the audience, the Pedro Arenas, the, the Nawa phrase book that you talked about is, uh, as far as I know, the most frequently republished uh, indigenous language text in all of Latin America. And uh, it's fascinating on many, many levels, because you're right, it's, it's go get my laundry, this guy's a drunk, it's, it's all about practical stuff. And the printer of it, uh, or the first printer of it, was Enrico Martinez, who was the, um, the engineer for the Desagüe. Um, so he obviously saw its clear utility for, for that. And again, the most re frequently republished indigenous language text. And I haven't really done a census, but it, it, it's even of all texts, it's one of the more frequently uh, republished. It's a small little pamphlet about that big, and it sold for the price of an enormous folio volume. So, and this, you know, to get back to, to the issue of format with Sten, which I think this is one thing that we need to start working in collaboration with each other, is that um, I think it's fascinating that you see this, incre this massive increase in sheets, which is one thing, um, but in format and folios like that, because and it gets later than your time in Mexico, and probably in Lima too, I think. But in Mexico, certainly, you also see this massive increase in number of sheets coming off the press from various printers. But it's for a completely different reason. It's for small format novenas that take a single sheet and they're <coughs> printed in a thousand copies apiece, right? So it's not for the big folios for the devotional book, but for private devotional work. So I think it's fascinating that kind of similarities on the one hand, but significant differences on the other. Alpin. Um, I had a question for Professor Rezek. Um, first of all, I'd like to echo Ken, Ken's compliments. That, that was incredibly rigorous research and very interesting. I appreciate it very much. Um, I'm wondering about, um, it's kind of a selfish question. I'm wondering about the figure of uh, Jupiter Hammond and where, if at all, he might factor into the study. Because you're starting with Wheatley and Sancho, he seems to get uh, left out of the, the, the narrative a little bit, despite the fact that he's often taken as the first published African-American author, often cited as such, but then quickly dismissed, partly because he doesn't do the work of disrupting a kind of racialized discourse or a pro-slavery discourse, but often does kind of extol his uh, fellow slaves to obedience in a way that, you know, it, uh, uh, it's, there's a complete absent radicalism that you know, African-American scholars um, are looking for there. And yet, at the same time, as you were describing Marantz, um, uh, taking to task of the, the, the inhumane slaveholder, mm -hmm. the, you know, slavery, that does also echo some of um, uh, Hammond's uh, ameliorationist discourse, right? So I'm wondering if the methodologies of print culture might be used to 
Yes, um, uh, it's a great question. And the reason why I, I, I account for uh, Brittenham and, and Jupiterham and other earlier pre-Wheatley pre -Wheatley texts, um, but the significance, the, the chronology of my project begins with Wheatley and Sancho because their, the, the, their books, from a print culture perspective, their books were the first kind of um, materially formidable objects. Um, so you have frontispieces, you have, um, you have more than 128 pages, um, you have uh, subscription lists, um, the, early, the early, earlier printed texts, you could go back to 1746, newspaper poems published by African American writers in, in, the, in North America, um, the pamphlets, the more ephemeral things, Wheatley published broadsides before she published her book of poems in London. But I think the, what it inaugurates this wide ranging public discussion about black authorship um, are the appearance of formidable uh, material uh, books um, in 1773 and 1782. I'll point out too that Wheatley, I mean, uh, Sancho was not, an, uh, he, he was against slavery, but he wasn't a polit staunchly political abolitionist like Equiano, and there are a lot of texts um, in the later period too that aren't, that have not been celebrated and heralded as great uh, radical political statements. Um, including northern writers, northern black writers from New York who thought their southern brethren were still too ignorant to be emancipated in the, as late as 1812. Um, so I, not excluding uh, Jupiter Hammond or Britton Hammond or the earlier texts, um, on, from a political perspective, I'm, I'm, I'm noting the fact that a, I think a cultural shift happens when the first formidable printed objects by authors of African descent appear in London and are widely read all over Europe, all over the Americas, Countless people commented on Wheatley and Sancho and paired them together as, as now we have these specimens for the first time. So that and they weren't saying that about Britton Hammond or Jupiter Hammond earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. You mean over the whole period? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's interesting what you say. I haven't looked at the actual increase of colleges around around the world uh, at that at that particular period, but it's very clear that um, uh, as soon as they start dealing or, or trading books on a very international scale, that to some aspect the Jesuits are always in in the picture. Um, um, we have we have a lot of letters from Jesuits writing to the to the Vatican also to order private books or to order books for some somebody else, but as far as I I, I found it uh, uh, at this very moment is that um, uh, what the Jesuits are actually doing is they are uh, they are ordering books for example in in, in Seville uh, for a college uh, somewhere uh, for example in Paraguay there was a uh, a huge uh, shipment of books that I, that I found for more than uh, 20,000 pesos worth. Um, and um, so um, it, they, they can secure that, I mean, they are want to work with them because they are sure that they are going to get paid this way. This is always the way, the difficulty in, in getting paid in, when you're dealing with international uh, shipments because there is no legislation whatsoever. It all happens on trust. And I think the Jesuits were an, an excellent institution to work together with, and they were particularly strong also in the low countries. Um, they worked very closely uh, with a lot of printers. So there would have been a, a large uh, representation of Jesuits also in the, in the low countries that could help with connections, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Tanya. Well, being familiar of the Inquisition meant uh, some privileges, as I said, the taxes, um, exemptions, um, some kind of protection uh, against justice. Uh, 
Um, and, it's, and also, it, it meant a closer relationship with the Inquisition, and that was also a good business, because for instance, the Inquisition needed paper, um, bl uh, white books, uh, I mean books for, ri uh, for writing, empty books. Uh, so they were the ones selling that for the Inquisition. Um, they needed binding books, and they were these uh, booksellers that were familiares of the Inquisition, or with links with, uh, to it. They were the ones doing that business. And at the same time, the Inquisition sometimes was, was a way of dealing with com uh, competitors. For instance, again, uh, Andrea Peccioni, that I have no idea if he was uh, familiar. I have not found any evidence. But one of the first things he did when he arrived to Seville was going to the castle of the Inquisition and denounced how the uh, Protestants were uh, sending books from La Rochelle in France to Seville. And what was the circuit that they used for that? Although what he said is that they were sending, right now, white paper. I said, well, so what's the point? So he was just, yeah, but he's a Protestant and he has a brother here, this merchant from La Rochelle, he's a well-known Protestant with a brother here, and he's a foreigner, as he was already. But, uh, so he's a big problem. He, he was just cutting with the competition. So, but, um, and other familiares, like Alonso Montero, he had this huge business with the Nuevo Rezado. Um, and he also, because even the Inquisition, in some documents, they express some doubts about his uh, limpieza de sangre, you know, if he was a real uh, old Christian or not. And his brother-in-law in Mexico, he was being tortured by the Inquisition. But he managed to keep his business on with no problem because he has the direct contact with, the, with them. So it was a protection and a good business. It was another institution uh, that you have to deal with when you were a, a bookseller. And we have many other examples in different cities about uh, booksellers who are also familiares of the Inquisition. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. And, and in Spanish America as well, both in Lima and in Mexico, the family that I work on was the mm -hmm. official printer for the Inquisition. Yeah. And someone, uh, someone asked me at one point, it's like, well, do you think they did that to um, buy off the Inquisition, right, to get special privileges. And, and in thinking about it a, a bit further, uh, I, I, I came to the conclusion that it's not buying them off, it's buying into them, right? They're completely closely allied with one of the major institutions of power. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the case of the family that I work on, sons were officials of the Inquisition, one of the women in the family married the Inquisition notary. They were completely hand yeah. in glove. Yeah. And taking care of their competitors too, yeah. right? Exactly. Or having, uh, being vigilant on their mm. competitors as well. Mm. Stuart. Uh, uh, I had uh, just a comment and a, and a question. Uh, comment about the exchange uh, between Sir Maya and, uh, and Martin here. Um, the Spanish weren't the only ones who were writing these kinds of books of how, how to deal with, with the other at this time. At the end of uh, Jean de Lerie's book about his uh, contact in Brazil, there's a whole section of uh, how to deal with the Tupinamba and, the, and the, their language and the questions that you would, you would ask them. And it's 1580, it's the same, the same mm -hmm. period, it's the end of the 16th century. So this seems to be a general mm -hmm. European phenomenon, but not yeah, probably. Spanish one. Uh, the other question I had was, was about the, uh, Professor is, uh, is about the, the detailed chronology that you offer us is very interesting in terms of the publication history, mm -hmm. but looking at the dates, it's also very interesting in terms of the changes going on in the attitudes towards slavery. This is exactly the moment of mm -hmm. the abolitionist, the rise of the abolitionist movement mm -hmm. and the reaction of the kind of ameliorationists. And so I wonder whether whether the change in the references to slavery hmm. might be paid to that chronology rather than to the internal chronology of the publication. Um, well, the, but the, 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 te the textual history of the paragraph about slavery is that it was published in 1785 in this edition and then it not, re not reprinted until, until you know, 
the 20th century. So the, all the reprints in the, in, the ninth, in the early 19th century don't have the episode about slavery at all. So, so they're, they're and, and, you, and many of them delete Moran's race entirely from the title page. So you read uh, these Halifax, this like Morant Renaissance in the Halifax, Halifax in 1808 to 1813, it's not even a black text. It's just, just a, it's a captivity narrative. And, and, and the fact that it, it is by a writer who was of African descent is, is sort of lost. So I, I'm not, I've thought about the, certainly um, the other, the, the text that derived from the Aldridge edition in the 1820s is probably about, is probably related to um, the increasing pressure of, about emancipation. That wasn't me. Um, increasing, increasing pressure about emancipation in the British, in, in Britain. But again, the text, we have to, I think we have to link these chronologies to what's happening in Britain because they're not being reprinted in, in the US. Right, yeah, but no, I think that's probably something to be said about that, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for, for one more question. We have lunch here, so our speakers will be here, I hope, and we can continue conversation on a more informal basis, but well, we'll take one more question over here. I have a question to Professor Lindsay. Yeah. And, um, as you were giving your talk, I was thinking about James Sidbury's book, Becoming Africa, mm -hmm. to Black Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And for him, the back and forth between these writers in, in, in the U.S. and in England mm -hmm. is very important in terms of identity formation. But your research, where does it leave us in terms of the Black Atlantic, which is part of your title? Right. Um, uh, I think Sidbury's work is great, and I think that the, the, these writers, um, a lot of them traveled back and forth across the Atlantic, and they had their identities formed in, in according to the logic of you know what Paul Gilroy describes in the Black Atlantic. Um, Morant certainly, certainly, his experience tracks a kind of transatlantic uh, identity. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm sort of I, I buy into completely Gilroy's analysis and the legacy of that analysis. I think some, some of the, by adding to it a kind of discussion of the history of print, I think um, it takes us away from the kind of biographical narratives that are often told in, in early Black Atlantic scholarship about people crossing the Atlantic physically as sailors. Equiano was a sailor, Wheatley went to London. I think in it, I, I work in these, these early uh, black writers in New York and Philadelphia who didn't travel the Atlantic world, but they're immersed in a fully transatlantic print culture. So I think that the Atlanticness of this archive is both based on um, a kind of racialized subordination in the, in the experience of the Atlantic world, but also on, on reading and textuality and the history of, of, of um, textual transmission in print, too. All right. With that, I want to say thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to all of you for coming and for your interesting questions and comments. Please join us for lunch, and we will reconvene here at 2 o'clock.